Okay, apologies for the delay. Uh, just to recap, this meeting is uh, to an extraordinary meeting to cover the closure of certain uh, GP surgeries and a review of uh, local um, doctor surgeries within the uh, re uh, region. Um, I would, uh, we've just had a, a presentation from Will regarding North Ferriby and, um, and, uh, and the uh, Swanland surgeries. So uh, we'd like to cover now uh, questions. So uh, any questions to, to start regarding the closure of these two surgeries, please? Councillor Winter. Yeah, yeah. It's good with asking this one. The, Fer the, the Fer North Ferriby branch that is to be closed, uh, it, it, would it be possible or not, I don't know the actual history of it, to actually um, extend it or build another surgery around that area? I mean, I had a similar experience where I live in the village of Roos, several, well, it could be 20 odd years ago now, when they, um, they tried to close the surgery and local councillors, the MP of the day, Mr Cram, all got together and got it stopped and they built one just a few hundred yards away. I just wonder if that was possible to do that in, in North Ferriby. Is that, a, is that a feasible? Would it be cost effective or is that off the table completely? Thank you. Hello. Um, hello, I'm uh, Dr. Jeffries, the clinical chair. I'll just answer that. There is actually another surgery in North Ferriby run by Dr. Robert Mitchell and his list is open. Um, and also uh, th there are other practices that cover the area. Um, there, uh, we haven't looked at the feasibility, but it would be very, very unlikely that in a village the size of North Ferriby, we, we would be able to find a site um, and be able to justify another surgery. But there is already another surgery in North Ferriby. Yeah, Councillor Fox. Thank you, Chair. How many patients per week will be affected by the Swanland practice closure? So, uh, size. How many patients? But, yeah. So, Will, could you take that? Have you got that detail? Will, William, are you able to address that question? Um, yeah. I mean, Swan and Surgery uh, will had one GP on a Monday and a nurse on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday morning. So there was only one and a half days uh, covered in, in the practice for clinical cover. What it did have was a receptionist and some admins, so people were able to phone up the uh, practice and book in, a uh, book in, or come and collect prescriptions, or you know have bloods taken in there. The number of people they saw between about they're saying that they they were down twelve every time they went to Swanland they had to do twelve less appointments as a GP than they would do if they were at Willoughby. Uh, so if you work on a, a doctor does about fourteen appointments in the morning and could potentially do 14 in the afternoon a session as well so you're probably looking about 16 patients a week who had the opportunity to go to Swan and would, could be booked into into Anderby in the future I've come back with another question on that please um, these 15 patients are they the vulnerable and the elderly, and they the ones, or is it as cross section of patients? I don't. We don't have that information. It'd be a cross section, obviously, probably predominantly. It would be working age because working age would be at work, but it'd be young young mothers as well. You know, so there'd be the young people as well. I have. We don't have figures on that. I can't answer that. Uh, well, I've got a question for you. Um, You've mentioned the fact that the North Ferriby branch uh, has been running a very limited service since 2015. Um, has it always had a limited service? I mean, if the building's only ever had, had facilities to have one GP, it, it, it's not come as a complete shock, has it? I mean, that's one of the reasons why it, you're closing, because you're saying that there's only one GP can work there alone. Um, well, how many GPs did it have? In, t in 28 or 2010, for example, what's, what's suddenly changed in the last five years? 
No, I mean, it's always been thus. I mean, you've always been able to have one GP work there at a time. You've never had two working GPs in the time I've been here since. Uh, you've never had two GPs. It was one session. They used to do they used to do more sessions there, and that might have been mornings or afternoons throughout the week, but not every single day. They've never had an. It's never been open every single day. Uh, so they've only because of the premises and the restrictions you've got on it, you can only you can only have one GP working in the premises. Yeah, but that's time. the point I'm making that you've yeah. only ever had one GP. So. Reading this, you're you're using that reason, the fact that a GP working alone at a branch site will also be isolated when presented with an emergency to which a team response would be usual. Well, that's always that's been ever thus, hasn't it? That's always been the case since it started. So you, you can't use that as an excuse for closure because you've only ever had one GP working there right from the onset. Um, if I um, could answer that term, please, Councillor Beaumont. What was a change? Originally, there was a practice in North Ferriby run in the front room of a local GP. Back in the days when GPs did work alone from their own house, when he retired, the village hall very kindly agreed with, in collaboration and the list was taken over by Hesselgrange to put in one room. In the meantime, medicine has moved on dramatically and now GPs do not work alone. We work in a team. Patients have high expectations of the care that they receive, and it is not possible for sole practitioners to continue. And so what has changed is uh, the, the, rightly so, the quality of care, the, the, uh, the care that GPs offer. And it is just not possible for a GP to work alone in a, a room on their own. <clears throat> so that, that, that's what's changed. Plus, of course, the pandemic means that the building now is not suitable for use, is not COVID secure. And and so no services have been offered that there since um, since last March, um, and we can't um, we can't say that because in 2000 it was uh, sufficient to offer modern medical care that in 2021 it is sufficient. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Padden. Uh, thank you, Chair. My main question is getting back to the previous question on telephone calls. Are you not in a position to monitor incoming calls? How long they last from the dropout? Do they return the calls? Um, the frustration of people trying to get through. I'm not about general now. I'm not knocking the door at North Ferriby. So surely there must be some sort of way of determining the number of people who are trying to access the surgery that will give you the input that we need to up the market, uh, expand it in every respect. Now, building property out there is getting on. It's going to get uh, far, far better, more houses, more people. So what are we doing to accommodate the increase in population in that area? Asking people to travel a long distance is it, not very practical. Uh, is there a long-term solution or has that not been brought into fruition yet? I wonder well, whether uh, Will might be able to answer that and then maybe Dr. Jeffries might be able to come in in terms of the um, uh, issues around the state. Uh, there's there, yeah, several questions. I'll, I'll answer the last one last. I mean, the whole premise of building the new Anlaby build, uh, so will it be approached us about building a new Anlaby build? We work closely with the local authority and the housing departments. So we know how many houses are going to be built when. We can, in, we can look at the increase in population that's expected. So will it be approached us to say we need to build a brand new facility because we, we, we're full, we're landlocked where we currently are. The Swandon branch is a listed building, you can't expand that, it is also nothing there. So they were, they were on the verge of closing lists, which has been disastrous for all the new people moving into the area who need to adopt it locally. Uh, they wouldn't be able to register with the local doctor. So they've approached us with this with proposal to you know, some a long time ago for a new premises so they could expand. And this is what the Annaby uh, bill is going to be. It will take, absorb the current population, registered population, and have room to absorb several thousand more new people, which we're expecting from the new bills that are going to be built here. Um, in terms of whether we look at existing property, we always look at existing property, extensively look at existing property. There is numerous reasons why we can't uh, expand some, some properties. Some are not suitable for expansion. Some just haven't got the population that you need to build an extended property. And the difficulty with people, places like 
uh, North Therapy is, as, as uh, Dr. Jeffers has already mentioned, there is already another practice in there that has an open list. We're only talking a small number of patients who actually register with the Hessel Grain practice for the North Ferriby branch. And the majority of these people have been, since pandemic, been traveling to um, Hessel Grains to receive their long-term conditions and their ongoing care. Um, so there's that. So that's the, I don't know if that answers all your questions, but does that answer the fact that we, we do always look at, there's huge pieces of work going on looking at the current estate. We've got, if you look in the paper, to support GPs and increase access, we're looking at lots of additional uh, allied healthcare roles that will increase the opportunity for appointments to be seen in primary care. All these new roles, which is we're expanding hopefully this year from 36 support in primary care across the East Rite to 114 this year, we've got plans for that expansion. All these people need rooms to see patients in. And the existing property where some of them are you know, at capacity now, so there's not that opportunity. So we're always looking at those opportunities to build. The thing, again, Dr. Jeffries also mentioned, is, is the efficiencies and it's the, uh, it's the new ways we deal with medicine is, and advancements in medicine. A new facility brings so many more diff, uh, possibilities to the area. So the Annaby build in itself the idea of that was to absorb the new properties being built across Willoughby, Kakella, in Swanland as well, you know, to be able to, to, so the people could have somewhere they could register and see a GP. Thank you. And yes, I mean, I agree with everything Will has said, and I'll just pick up about your questions about the telephones. Each okay. um, surgery has their own telephone system and a lot of um, uh, time and money has been put into uh, improving that during the, the pandemic and many surgeries have upgraded their phone system um, because, because of the demand on the telephone. We don't have figures per surgery um, at the CCG because that is their internal information, but we do have help them to use it as efficiently as possible. But this is one reason why we would ask patients that who, who can submit queries online or through the NHS app to do so um, as this frees up time on the telephone for those people who are not so uh, digitally literate or, or um, confident in using digital. Um, but certainly individual practices can give you uh, data, but we don't hold it. But we would like to encourage people uh, to use online uh, versions or go uh, elsewhere for their information such as the NHS website or directly to the hospital if it's a hospital query to, to try and help ease the pressure on GP telephone services. I think you might find that um, your statement of uh, improving telephone services in GPs might be questioned uh, later this morning but uh, for the moment uh, Councillor Horton Thank you. Uh, yes, my question relates to both surgeries, but for both of them, you said that you'd engaged with a number of stakeholders, including local residents and resident uh, registered patients. I wonder if you could tell me approximately, approximately how many responded, uh, what worries and concerns might have been raised, and could you Describe the level of concern. Was it low? Was it moderate? Or was it high? Thank you. Um, that's fine. Thank you, uh, Councillor Horton. I, I will bring uh, Will in for some of that detail, but I just did want to say, um, and I would have said it at the beginning, but I think uh, my microphone wasn't working, that the uh, planned relocation um, uh, to Annaby of Swanland and, and Willoughby surgeries has been um, something that's been... In, uh, been planned for nearly 15 years we think we talked about it this morning sorry Paula it's it's a it's a shocking line I can't hear what you're saying at all I apologize oh, okay no, no no worries I think I'm having some microphone problems because earlier I was speaking and I'm pretty yeah, sure nobody no. could hear me so sorry okay it, it, it's not working at all, I'm afraid, from your point of view, Paul. Okay. Um, okay. And, okay. Uh, either Will or, or, or Anne, I'll suggest, 
is going to have to answer the question. Okay. Um, well, I'll start, but I think, and Will might have the detail. Uh, Paula was saying there was extensive uh, consultation over the uh, uh, Swanland Willoughby move to Anlaby. Um, it's certainly been going on ten years in detail, and um, and we actually found some papers going back fifteen years. So extensive. I can't, we can't give you numbers of letters because it was all done a while ago, and the decision was made a while ago, and it was just delayed because of the pandemic. Uh, Hessel Grange recently has sent out a letter to all uh, the patients who use that surgery um, and had meetings with their PPG, with the CCG and with the LMC. Uh, and Will might have a bit more detail. There was a, a mixed response. There's, there's always um, questions about transport. However, there was also a lot of support for it because uh, people who go to the premises in North Ferriby, and I don't know if any of the councillors have been, it is extremely small, it is not private, they have to have the radio on because otherwise you can hear the consultation and there was a lot of feedback that people could see that they were inadequate premises and they would rather go to Hessel Grange because they got such better care. So it was a mixed response, um, but they have uh, contacted every patient with a Ferriby address that, uh, that is registered with Hessel Grange. Yeah. In terms of actual numbers, I haven't got them to hand. But as Anne says, there's a mixed response from local residents, some supporting the move, others not. And if I was to say if there was a theme, it's the usual theme, it's the transport theme, you know, the car ownership, how are we going to get there? But that's why no decision has been made by the Primary Care Commissioning Committee yet. Uh, we need to see more information on the feedback, more collation of what it's actually telling us before we can make a decision. We need to do that equality and impact assessment, which looks at the impacts of all the different uh, cohorts of patients there are in, in that it serves. And that does include transportation. So when any we do one of these uh, quality impact assessments, if there is a, a cohort of patients that is uh, disadvantaged, they have to put mitigation action in to, you know, to su support uh, how they're going to deal with that. So again, we're not there yet. No decision's been made. That's been fed through and that piece of work's been done. So we've got, you've got all the evidence. Now you've got to do the impact, uh, uh, the quality impact assessment. And if there are any disadvantaged uh, people in North Ferriby, we've got to look at the mitigation that we've got to put in place. And that's part of the internal process we have before any decision is made. So the... The actual request will come, the reasonings for it, you know, which you, is in the paper. And then we've got to make a balanced view on what that, what, what, on the decision. But the decision on about, it will be wider than just the people of the practice, because it's given that there is a practice in the village that is open and is, is one of the best practices in, nationally in the country. It comes in the top 50 year on year on year in terms of patient feedback and everything. You've got your... You're very, very lucky in North Ferriby having Dr. Mitchell on the practice there. And also, you know, it's just, it's just looking at all these, all, all these other things we've got to look in place. But no decision has been made yet, uh, Councillor Horton. OK, just, I'd just like to ask uh, Councillor Walker, the portfolio holder, to... Uh, I think she has a few comments to make, please. Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me to join and to be able to speak to, with your scrutiny committee. Um, I speak with, in a way, two hats on. One is having a portfolio for um, adults and health and chairing East Riding's Health and Wellbeing Board, but I'm also one of two of the local ward councillors in South Hunsley Ward, which covers North Ferriby and Swanland. So um, I'll try and give um, a balanced approach, but first of all, regarding Swan um, North Ferriby, in terms of consultation, when my fellow ward councillor, Julie Abraham, and I um, uh, came to our attention that there was an uh, intention to close North Ferriby, um, one of the senior partners from Hesel Grange telephoned me personally. And his opening words were, in quite a shouty voice, I am really pissed off with you for objecting to the closure of this surgery. Forgive my language, Chair, but that was exactly what was said, and I quote that. I tried to engage in a constructive conversation with the senior partner, and one of the questions that I asked was, um, given that as a representative of people, we believe that there will be a handful, and maybe not that many, of our North Ferriby residents 
who are very elderly and very frail, who rely very much on being able to access services locally. And so I asked the GP and said, could you look at, you know, search your records, find out who they are, and then be able to assure us that those people's needs, those maybe most elderly frail um, residents of ours, their needs would be met, whether that would be through the actual surgery itself, but through transport or through regular visits from, for example, just district nurses or other, or, or the GP or something like that. And what I was told in no uncertain terms, I haven't got time to do that. You go and do it yourself. Well, as you know, as ward councillors, we don't have access to, um, to uh, uh, that, that type of information or data. Now, since then, as ward councillors, we have um, you know, objected and we are supporting and representing our residents and particularly our most frail residents. So I would like to ask the CCG to ask the same question of that practice, of Hesel Grange practice, what are they doing to discover their top 20, for example, most elderly and frail patients living in North Ferriby who are un unable to access that surgery anymore? With my strategic portfolio hat on, I can honestly say that it's quite possible that the actual room um, may no longer be fit for purpose. And as a qualified nurse who hasn't worked since the eighties, if healthcare hadn't moved on since I was a nurse, um, we would still be in hospital for 10 days when not, nowadays we can have day cases. So I absolutely do support the, 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 the overall strategic notion that patients should have, have access to um, to the right type of services delivered in the right place. So in that sense, I welcome that. But Dr. Jeffries, I think, said that the other practice in North Ferriby has got an open list. Well, I would say try asking any of the residents in North Ferriby if Dr. Mitchell's list is open. I've telephoned that practice on behalf of some of my residents um, before. And, and, you know, one Recently, somebody who's moved in who's got a disability and a, and a, and a son at school and uh, put her in touch with the, the practice and rang them myself. And so there's a long wait to get into Dr. Mitchell's surgery. Now, if something's changed, I'd be really pleased to, to, to learn about, about that. That's North Ferriby. Swanland, the same issue applies. Um, I can see the need... You know, I think the contract runs out anyway on the, on, on the, the um, tenancy for Swanland. But I would also urge the CCG, please, to ask um, the practice at Willoughby to identify who their patients are, who are the most vulnerable, the most frail, the most elderly, the people who will benefit at the moment from the hours that are open by seeing the, ner uh, the nurse or a doctor, even if it is only on one and a half days a week. Um, if that serv service is going to be closed down, um, then there will be people who are disadvantaged. Not that many people. I don't think that big an investment that both those practices could make to, um, to, to discover who they are and put transport and, and services in for those people at, when they need it the most. And that's whether or not anybody wants to answer that question. I was at the, um, I did attend the CCP AGM last night and, you know, I listened to the same uh, discussion that we've just had today. And I'm pleased now to have had the opportunity to voice my views as both ward councillor and as portfolio holder. Um, um, can, can, I, thank you. can I please come in? Is that better for the sound for me? Is that any better to call the south again? No, no better? Better. Oh, good. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, uh, Councillor Beaumont, I wonder if I could just come in and then maybe pass over to um, Dr Jeffries and, and, and William for, for some detail. So, what I'd like to say to Councillor Walker, you're shaking your head. You, you can't hear me, can you? No. Sorry, it's, 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 it's no good, I'm afraid, Paul. Okay, I, okay. You know, that's fine. Maybe, Dr Jeffries, yeah. could you pick up the, the point, please? 
Yes, yes, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to pick that up. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Walker. That w was a very interesting update. Firstly, I'm very sorry you had such an unsatisfactory uh, telephone conversation with the senior partner. Um, um, and I can see that you would feel that that wasn't very helpful at all. Um, it is possible for general practice to look for very frail patients on their patient record. And no, um, we wouldn't expect and Well, the local authority can't do that. And, and rightly so, these are health service records. And um, I will have a word with the Hessel Grange doctors. It will be very few. Now, uh, and there are different ways of putting in services, of course. Um, transport, unfortunately, is outside our remit, but GPs do still do home visits. The district nurses certainly do home visits. An awful lot can be done now over the telephone um, and we can arrange appointments around, um, you know, the times when a patient may be able to get a lift. So if they need a blood test or a heart tracing done, which would have to be done in Hessel Grange and always has had to be done in Hessel Grange, um, you know, we, we the GPs are usually very helpful. Well, if your daughter can bring you on a Thursday, absolutely no problem. We'll fix up both appointments on a Thursday. And that individual care, uh, you know, sh should and can be delivered by general practice. Um, and um, I think that is something that, that we can look that we can look it up to, look into. Um, your, the, the phone call about Dr. Mitchell is also interesting. And, and um, I think we need to chase that up because uh, Dr. Mitchell's list is open and GPs don't run waiting lists. So I think we do need to chase that up, Will, if you could do that. Um, in um, From a contractual status, GP lists are open, in which case anyone within the boundary can register and they register that day. You go in, give your details and that's registered. We have some practices that take what are called allocations only, which goes through the CCG and NHS England, but that is not Dr. Mitchell's. Um, as far as I know, actually, it's just in Bridlington at the moment, so not not, not relevant to this yet. So we will look into that, but GPs do not hold a waiting list. Um, so I think somewhere along the line, we need to sort that out, and I'm sure we'll, we'll look into that and we'll get back to well, you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, are you happy with that response, Councillor Walker? Thank you, Chair. I'll be pleased to hear the outcome of that. So, thank you, Dr. Jeffries. Okay, I I'm conscious that uh, time marches on. We've been told that we have till twelve thirty before the banging recommences. So, uh, I understand there's a question from uh, from yourself, Linda, and also from Councillor Jefferson, and then. If that, if we can call that this first section to a close, and um, start with the uh, the report of the PCNs, please. So. Thank you, Chair. I was just wondering. I mean, we haven't had the information that there are, is more than one surgery in North Ferriby. Which came first? Was it Dr. Mitchell's or the outpatient sort of from Hazel? And why, well, why before, was the other one put there? No, the, the other one, there had been two single-handed GPs in North Ferriby. And then when the, the first one, I think it was Dr. Peebles-Brown, retired, Hessel Grange took his list over. So there were, there's always been two. There's always been two, right. Yeah. It just doesn't seem a big place to have two surgeries. I, I agree, actually, but that's an even more difficult decision. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Jefferson. I was just picking up on uh, one of the questions earlier on from Councillor Fox when she asked about patients' lists. Um, and Will didn't actually, I think, answer the question. How many is on the list at North Araby and how many was on the list at Swanland? Because doctors have lists. And I'm interested to know, uh, I can see you saying no, but I have always been informed that they have a list. And are all of those actual patients involved? Have they been informed what's going on and where they're likely to have to go to? Has it been made very clear? Have they had an option? And the last question is, um, because I, I listened to it on the radio, when a gentleman said he'd been asked to leave because he was outside the area. What's happening to those patients if they fall into this category? Uh, 
patient lists are now held by practices, not held by individual GPs. So the practice well, certainly knows where the patients are, but well, not well, we really are talking individual. Of, yeah, yes, but obviously we are talking of two practices, aren't we, which are closing? No, but they're part of bigger practices. So the list is held by Lit Willoughby and the list is held by Hessel Grange. So we can search on address. Um, but we, uh, and the patients in uh, North Therapy with a the North Therapy address have had a letter. So that, that's how we find the patients uh, there. Patients who are out of the area are asked to register with a GP who, who where they in the area that they do live. Nobody, nobody in East Riding, well, anywhere in the country, but certainly in East Riding will be without a GP. But will they have an option? If, if they live in an area where there's an overlapping of practices, yes. And in most of these cases, that there is an option, yes. But we can't absolutely guarantee that in some of the more rural areas. So you don't actually know then? Yeah, we, we have we, the we practice have numbers, boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. Every practice, Councillor Jefferson, has a practice boundary. And you're meant to, patients should register with, the pay, with a practice across your boundary. Every single square inch of the East Riding has is in, is in is within a boundary of a practice. Where you get larger conurbations of population, Beverly, Bridlington, Driffield, you tend to get options. You've got two in Driffield, you've got four in Beverly, you've got the six in Bridlington. And you get a look at a map of the town there, you've got a scattergun approach, you know, anywhere in the town could go to any one of the of the what uh, any of the practices where you've got more rural you tend to just be covered by the one just because of the reality of the uh, nature so what's happening now is it's within the gms contract so if people are, are outside the boundaries and this is where it's important this is the conversation i was talking about we're talking with the local planning team about where houses are going to be built so we know in certain areas across the east Ryan, there's going to be large population increases uh, because of that, some practices are at capacity now and they can't take on anymore, can only take a few numbers. So they're looking at their boundaries, about restricting their boundaries in some case, but we have to make sure that, that everybody who moves into somewhere has, about, has uh, access to a GP practice. Now, this is happening with our colleagues in Hull as well. And we, you know, there's conversations about a certain big practice in Hull that's looking to change their boundaries. So people from, you know, in the East Riding, may not be able to you know register with the whole practice anymore because they're looking at their boundary because they're at a limit of their numbers they can take but i think just give assurances to everybody everybody in east riding is within a boundary of a practice what we've got to try and do is keep the practices open for local residents so what we're saying is that the actual new build won't be ready aren't we for what sorry for any new uh, patients going in. You mentioned January, then it was late January, and now it's future 22. No, it's, it's Are we still a date Jan or not? It, it's still, well, there is a date, but I mean, these things move. It is still a January day, 2022. And from word go, the conversation we've been having is that, you know, to, building this thing is, is, is to attract or consume new pe residents that move into the area. So that's the conversation. The idea from the word get go, we're looking to, the list will be open for new people moving into the area, which will take pressure off the Anlaby surgery, which is very, very, very busy. We shall take pressure off the Hessel practice, which is incredibly busy. And, you know, the old Willoughby practice was at its limits anyhow, because it's landlocked and where it could go. So this will, it's like easing the pressure cooker. It'll take, there'll be an opportunity for patients moving into the, uh, this Holton Price area to register with the practice. I was more concerned about the residents who actually live here and in these areas than who's moving in. Yes, that was my point. Well, okay. all, all patients will be registered with a, a GP and in the mo most of East Riding there is a choice of general practice. So they, they, don't need, they, they, they don't need to be concerned about losing access to health care. No, well, of course not. And that's most important. And I, I wouldn't have expected you to say anything other than that, having listened last night um, on uh, YouTube or whatever to a very interesting um, in AGM. However, I still am concerned that the people who actually are in North Therapy and in Swanland, you are really telling us they know exactly what's happening and when it's going to happen. 
Well, we can't give a date when the new build will begin offering services. We've heard today that the, the building works are actually going very well, and, and the, but the practice will need you know, to come up with a plan to move from their current premises into that. So, so they, they, there isn't a date for that, but there will be no loss of service. They will continue and then open up, and we know the building work is going well. So you, this is a, you know, a really good, good news for everyone in that area and that they are are on track to get a lovely new building with lots of facilities. But all patients have been written to mm -hmm. by both practices and it's on the uh, both websites of both practices there's an update on there so patients can, the opportun opportunity for patients to see this is there. Uh, can we say hand on hand if we realise it notice it we don't know what happens when people receive mail do we so but you know, we'll, we'll make sure that it continues. I should imagine people are aware of it. Well, I would hope they are, because not everyone goes on the website. No, but that's why we've written to everybody. Yeah, they've had the postal letters. Yeah, yeah. They've Thank had letters you. through the post. That's appreciated. Uh, just a quickie before I ask uh, Councillor Pan for his last uh, comments, that are uh, that when you're closing a surgery, um, where... Is that existing doctor or support staff going until their new surgery opens? Uh, is, there, is there room in another existing surgery for them to uh, offer additional services? Or what will they do? They're, silly. They're not going to go on holiday for three months. So what will actually happen? It, what, where will the staff go from the closure of one surgery before the opening of the new alleged super surgery? Both these premises are not full surgeries they are branch surgeries offering a very few hours per week and in Hessel in the therapy no hours per week so the staff are already working extremely hard and being very busy in the main sites in Willoughby and Hessel oh, okay. there is absolutely no chance of anyone in the NHS taking three months holiday uh, okay. Uh, okay so so let's put that that these staff are very busy in the main surgeries okay okay I, I, I'll leave the last word to Councillor Pam Pardon. However, um, forgive me for my cynicism, but um, we got notifications of the closure of these two surgeries just after um, recess commenced here. Uh, and it sounds like, although Will's been at pain to say that no decision's been made, I think that if I put a £5 note in an envelope, what I think the decision will be. So are we basically saying that the decision's already been made. You're going to accept the closure of both these surgeries. Swanland, well, the decision in Swanland was made, um, is it about two years ago now, uh, Will? So, the, yes, that decision has been made, yeah. has been through all our internal governance process with a lot of stakeholder engagement. The decision on North Ferriby has not been made and is due to go to primary care commissioning in November. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Pub. Thank you, Chair. I like, I like that last point. Uh, I happen to be the Anne Ward Councillor, and I go past this building every day, twice, sometimes five times a day. And I've seen it start from the boundaries going up, going forward and for about three weeks. I didn't see anybody working on it. Uh, the roof's not even on. They're starting doing the, uh, the gable ends. So time is in the essence if you're closing places down. When the letters first came out, this is a, a quote now, when the letters first came out about closing down and you change the boundaries, um, I go into Morrison's a lot doing a food bank pickup and I got inundated by people saying, how dare they send me a letter saying I've got to change my doctor's surgery. Why? I said, I don't know. So I looked up to, got copies of the letters, but what the letter did not say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that after 30 days, if you have not found an additional practice to take you on, you can return and still carry on saying your original practice, which is stated, I believe, in the NHS code. But that wasn't put down to the residents. So I was telling residents, just let the letter ride, forget the expiry date, keep going back to your own doctor. One person lives in Anderby and has been going to Branzo since he was born. And he said, I'm not changing, I'm staying in Branzo. So there's the differential of what people want, not what you're telling them they're going to have, people say, I'm not changing my doctor. I've been there 40, 50 years. So in that respect, I think people have not been given the right information. A lot of people are very, very unhappy with Anne Libby surgery 
because at the moment the infrastructure around there, the footpaths, the roads, the crossing at the roundabout, is a liability waiting to happen. I've written it many times to East Riding, asking them to have a look at it, to do a survey on it. Nothing's come back. The ridings across the road are complaining that people are starting to use their car park. The Spire is not very happy people using the car park because the car park on the other side, which is part of Spire, is starting to fill up. So we're not even getting up and running. The answer that ridings got coming back from the bill is that the 63 car parks space is allocated to the surgery. And as one of the residents of the riding says, well, that's the, the staff taken care of. Where do the residents go? So there's a lot going on, and I'm afraid life's not going to be easy. I'm sure you know about mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Does that warrant an answer, or are you happy with the statement Councillor Padden's given you? Um, I'm not entirely sure what his question was, to be honest. Um, 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 and I'm not as au fait with the Anne Libby premises as I am with the other two. Um, and I, I'm not, I, I don't, uh, the I'm first question I don't know much is, about the parking. Uh, the Anne letters Libby were Serbian. sent out and they were correct. Am I right in saying that after 30 days, the people were under the impression they didn't have a doctor? That was not stated in the letter. I'll have to, ch I'll have to sure. check the GMS, I'll have to check the contract on that yes, one. But I mean, my impression was if you were out of area, then that you could be removed. But there is still a provision for people to receive emergency care, which, of course, we always would. Um, but we don't have to offer full services. But it's best to discuss and for each patient to find something that suits them uh, with a local GP. Um, the, the more local you are, the better you are. We tie into the district nurses, local dentists, local pharmacists. Um, um, and things tend to flow a lot easier for the patient if they are registered with a local GP where, uh, where they are within their boundary uh, because we, we, like I say, we all have to work together now in a big team. So it is just so much better for each patient, for each of us to be registered with a local GP. Um, but I think within an individual case, we would have to look into that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to... Um call a halt to the point one and two now and uh, ask the CCG to make some comments on general practice and primary care networks. Can we restrict that to no more than 10 minutes because then that will allow us a, a good hour for, for questions, please. And do you want to take, this is the improved access. Right, session. okay, yes. Uh, um, so, um, so the development of PCNs, they've been um, around a, a, a good 18 months or almost two years now and have really come together during the pandemic um, and working together, sh sharing resources and knowledge. Um, and so, so that's an ongoing development, which we're very happy with. With improving access, we have um, appointments now, pre-booked appointments across the whole uh, CCG area into the early evening, into eight o'clock in the evening and Saturdays and Sunday mornings. Um, they are, some are based in practices and some patients will be offered an appointment um, in a neighboring practice. Um, we, we have lots of figures of that. It's very good uptake um, and very good patient feedback from that and has resulted in an extra 3,390 appointments on top of the ones offered during core hours which are eight till six and they've also a very low dna rate of two percent which is um, which is excellent the uh Receptionists in all practices know about these appointments and can inform patients and offer them on an equal basis with the core hour appointments. Um, it's advertised on web on the websites and, and the practice leaflets on the paper leaflets as well. Though I think the receptionists are probably key key to this. Um, we've done several campaigns at the CCG. Our communications team have been very busy, um, and there are posters up in every practice to to tell you about these extra appointments. We are under a lot of pressure at the moment. Demand is higher than I have ever known it in more than 20 years as a GP. Um, and I know patients are finding it difficult to get appointments, but we are offering um, more appointments than we ever have done, over 110 percent uh, compared to the baseline before the pandemic. So we are all working as hard as we possibly can to keep increasing the number of appointments. 
with digital, this really helps for patients who are happy to use um, digital access. You can um, email in your queries, use the telephone, and then there is a, a very small number of videos done. But for those patients who are happy to use a video on their phone, it can be really save a lot of traveling and a lot of time. And this helps us get us to the right care to the right patient as quickly as possible. A lot of PPGs are now working with their practices to uh, find out what is the best way to use digital. And we are really keen uh, are really keen to work with patients to find out how these new models can, can fit in with what the patient wants and what the patient needs. And of course, this this helps uh, mitigate some of the problems over transport, because if by using um, telephone and video consultations um, and electronic prescribing, which has really taken off during the pandemic, it saves the patient from having to attend in the first place. Um, and it can really, really make the care, delivery of care very, very efficient. So digital is an ongoing program, but we are really keen to hear of patients' experiences of that. Workforce, um, there's been a massive expansion, not, not in GPs, but in what are called additional roles. These are physiotherapists, pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, care coordinators, social prescribers, which have really added a lot of value to general practice. Um, Will has the figures and there is a table in the the paper. Um, we've made a good start with that, but in the next 12 months, we are hoping to really expand these roles. And these will be based in GP surgeries, working along general practitioners uh, to uh, improve, improve access, but also improve the care by offering lots of different skills. Um, and this is really a very exciting time, actually, to be working in general practice, um, because it is um, it's very enjoyable actually working as a team like this, but also means that you can handle a lot more problems within general practice, which is very satisfying for all, including the patient. I think a state we've actually probably covered, but it is very important that as we move forward in general practice, we have modern premises with good access, good parking, good ventilation, where all this team can work together. We also need to improve our training offer to young people um, and we, we need to grow our own workforce. Our, our biggest problem at the moment is workforce. And by being able to train people alongside uh, you know, qualified practitioners and to really show people the joy and satisfaction of working in general practice. But of course, they need rooms and we need extra rooms for medical students, nursing students, trainee physiotherapists, and so that we can develop a sustainable workforce and this really is, is really important at the moment. It's also important that GPs are leading research um, and this again needs to be done where the care is being delivered in general practice where the patients are and so we need room for that, we need good administrative staff, good managers and good IT and this all needs to be in modern premises. And really, that, that is the background to the GP narrative, which is the, the, the last um, paragraph on your paper, that there is a lot of change. Um, and it is difficult. It's difficult for patients and it's difficult for the staff as well, especially when we're under such pre pre uh, pressure uh, with such high demand and the backlog from the pandemic. However, if we get this right, if we really push forward um, in collaboration with all our partners, you know, these are exciting times and we will end up with a really first class, I mean, world class general practice here in East Riding. Um, and I'm really happy to take any questions um, because I really feel passionate that this is a good time to really move things forward and really improve and offer for high quality modern healthcare to our residents. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, before we ask uh, questions, I'd like to ask, ask one. Um, page four, 4.1, uh, commission weekday provision of access to pre-bookable and same day appointments in the evenings after 6.30 to provide an additional one and a half hours operational hours per day. Uh, and also appointments on both Saturdays and Sundays to meet mm -hmm. local population needs. I instantly went on to the park surgery in Driffield, uh, looked at their website, and it uh, very clearly told me that that was not true, that the appointment, uh, that the, the, the surgery was open from Monday to Friday, eight till six, Saturday and Sunday, 
closed ring one one one. So I'm at a loss uh, in right. the contradiction of that statement. Now, unless I'm as thick as a whale omelette, then I, and I've misunderstood. But my reading of this says that basically now we're open till eight eight o'clock in uh, Monday to Friday GP appointments and Saturdays and Sundays. And you know, the website and my local surgery is saying the complete opposite. Yeah. Park surgery patients do, do have access to appointments, um, not necessarily in your own surgery or with your own GP, but it, it is across the CCG. Um, but it should... Um, um, it sh there should be it should be um, marked on that, and the receptionist should be able to book you into these appointments. They may well be remote appointments, um, and they may not be delivered by a park GP because they work together, um, um, you, you know, with the other Driffield practice, and in fact with the Hornsey practice. Um, but I must admit, I haven't looked at the website, um, but we can have a word with Park. Well, uh, it's surgery. certainly not it's certainly not saying that. And if no. I was elderly and I wanted an appointment at weekend. I don't want to be going to Hornsey. Um, no, you know, there's no. I there's think, we, we, well, you I think, think what? Drift, Hornsey was mentioned as an alternative. That's the reason why I brought it up. No, myself. It's, it's, it's working in the geographical PCN area. The PCN area that covers, primary care network covers, because it's a large geographical area of the East Ride, it covers the two practices in Driffield. Leven and Beeford and Hornsey. So it covers a huge area. What tends to happen is that primary care network provides every evening within that primary care network extended access. So that means people can travel. It tends to be either in Driffield or Hornsey and Leven do, do that to take it in turns. We do, there is a local arrangement in place. It means that not every practice offers this, but it means there's access within your PCN area to be access services till you know till eight o'clock. It does mean some travel sometimes, but park surgery do occasionally do this have extended access in their facility and Saturday and Sunday. I don't think it's advertised on the website, but that's we're straying into a different area. That's that is a whole lot of work we need to do with practice websites. We appreciate that. And that's that's something on our agenda to do as we improve, you know, improve the offer for patients. We need to reflect that offer on practice websites and we're aware that that's that's a piece of work we need to do but uh, dr jeffries is quite quite right there is across these strides in august is nearly 3400 extra additional core point primary care points were offered and that means if we opened every single practice it wouldn't mean a whole lot but that's why we do things on a primary care network you gain that efficiencies, you gain that opportunity for people to stand forward and actually see patients over the weekends and in the evenings. Okay, I mean, it's not very clear in what you've said here. Anybody reading that would assume that their local surgery is now open till eight o'clock Monday to Friday and also we're taking appointments on a Saturday and Sunday at the surgery. Uh, and so I, I, think, I, think, I think one thing comes across is that Clearly, the website of part surgery is, is, is inadequate and inaccurate. And I would suggest that the CCG looks at every uh, surgery website because I suggest that mine is just as bad as anybody else's. OK. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask the Councillor Tucker that I think that we've got a good hour and five, hour and ten minutes of, of detailed questions now. So, Councillor Tucker, first of all, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, this question is for Dr. Anne, if I may. Um, Dr. Anne, in your um, dialogue, when you introduced this agenda item, you talked about exciting times and you see those ahead. Sadly, as a ward councillor, what I see ahead is a car crash waiting to happen. We are seeing more and more noise from the community. Only on Monday of this week, there was a public demonstration against one of our GP practices in Wivensey that deeply saddened me because the doctors and nurses are working incredibly hard to try and maintain services without South East Holderness. But there is something clearly wrong when you've got 100 residents marching upon a doctor's surgery to protest about and demanding we need to be heard. Myself, Councillor Holmes and Councillor Healing have been trying to support our doctor's surgery in Holderness Health. We've had multiple meetings and we're having ongoing meetings with them. We only met on Friday with our local MP trying to look at a way forward. The big issue around this is, is communication because 
Dr. Han, you spoke um, in your introduction about these opening hours, which the chairman just spoke about. I've just gone on the website on my phone now for Holderness Health that covers Hedden, Cayenham, Patrinson, Roos. Those times that you spoke about don't exist. They're not there. Now, obviously, there's some communication gap that's happening between the CCG and, and the, the healthcare providers because those appointments, just it's just not there or they're not being advertised for some reason. Now, one of the big issues that people were protesting about on Monday was getting seen. Now, at the moment, you have a telephone system, and dare I say, it's not fit for purpose. Because what happens is, and in fairness to your managers within Holderness Health, they held hands up and they agreed it's not really fit for practice. Members of the public, residents, the phone for hospital appointments or a doctor's appointment, they get put in a queuing system, and then in some cases they get burned back. Now, from personal experience, my own wife this week, she was in that queuing system. She did get a call back. She got to position number four and the call was dropped. If the system's really, really busy, and this is a major fault within the system, if that callback doesn't happen within two hours, the system automatically deletes that call and that resident never ever gets a call back. Now I did ask, is there a facility where that window could be open for a call back, say within three hours, if you've got a really, really busy time? And unfortunately, that isn't a, a, a facility that that offers. What concerns me as a war counselor is, I've been a war counselor not as long as some, maybe seven years now. I've got very little traffic regarding healthcare provision. It's daily now. And you know, to see the march, I mean, that march must have been so damaging for those doctors and the hardworking doctors and those nurses and those, and those clerical staff in that practice. How is that happening? Why, why we've got so much noise at the moment? And, you know, something needs to happen. We've got a hospital, right? When I spoke to the manager, uh, Amelia Booker, she spoke about, you know, they need more space. You've got an empty hospital next door, that's NHS properties, who want, as it, I can't remember, it's £10,000, we've got £10,000 a month to rent some space. Crikey, they've got to do something because if, if we don't do something now regarding healthcare provision for our holiness, this situation is not going to get better. There are housing developments on the horizon for, for say, Wivensea. That's going to bring an extra thousand people into that area. That will be a massive demand on those doctors who are struggling now, who are sinking. This is, and you know, I'm not having to go about at Dr. Anne. I'm not having to go about doctors. I'm not having to go about nurses. But there is something seriously wrong when you've got this much traffic. And I think, you know, we need to go back to the drawing board. And if it needs a new system, we need a new system. But people need to have the confidence. If they need a doctor's appointment, they're going to get one. And I just don't know the way forward because, you know, you've got your MPs involved. And, you know, I don't want to see any more protests, any more marches upon GP surgeries because that is so, so damaging. So, Dr. Anna, I'm really sorry. I didn't wish to challenge you, but I didn't need to challenge you on those opening hours because those that you gave to this um, committee, as our chairman just said, don't exist on his patch and they certainly don't exist on mine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, that I'll respond to those. Um, you're quite right. The march was hugely damaging, has caused an awful lot of uh, upset amongst the doctors and nurses who are working harder than they have ever done before. Um, and we are working closely with Holderness Health to support them. Um, I think the hours, we definitely need to work to do some work on communications there because the, hour, the, the appointments are there and we monitor them and they are being used. But clearly the communications are not getting out and, and we will look into that just like we said we would with the, with the Driffield ones. Holderness Health do offer extended hours, um, but, um, I, but they, must, they, they are being communicated differently. But we, we can look into that. The phone system in all practices have been overwhelmed recently. Demand is higher than it ever has been. As I say, we are offering 100 and in fact, 114 percent of appointments compared to before the pandemic. And yet we still have, um, you know, patients waiting a long time for appointments. The only way to do this is to keep transforming services, to encourage people to go online, to encourage people with self-care, to encourage people to use um, maybe a, a other methods of accessing healthcare. 
so that those that need to use the phone line can get through. Um, we have a huge workforce crisis. We do have vacancies in all the different roles um, and we are looking at ways of training patients locally, of getting local schools and colleges involved to encourage people to have a career in the NHS. Um, the pandemic has, the, before the pandemic, the NHS was coping, but there was no really slack in the system. Unfortunately, the increased demand now as we recover from the pandemic is, is showing those cracks. And you're absolutely right. The protest was not the right way to go about it and has unfortunately upset many people. Um, and I also agree with you. I hope we never have to you know, have, go through anything like that again. We work very closely with Holden Health and they offer an excellent service, um, but it, it is very difficult and you're quite right, but we have to plod forward with doing things in a different way. And it is change that will get us through this. Yes, Councillor Sucker. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Anne. So, I mean, I think we can both agree from what you've just said that, you know, the, the telephone system is one of the pitiful drivers that is causing so much unrest at the moment. And even your own Holdness Health staff are saying there are significant problems. I mean, what they say is a better system than the previous system, but it's still not right. They're, they're, they're acutely short of space, they're acutely short of staff to handle this. What can the CCG do, and maybe this is a question for Paula rather than Dr Anne, what can the CCG do to support Holdness Health that will help move this on? Because if we don't deal with this now, Paula, this will fester, this will get worse because, you know, there is great traffic on social media and, you know, I'm a registered nurse, I'm still practising and I know the damage that is causing to those staff and to those doctors and nurses and it can't continue. But the CCG needs to do something to prop up holding this health. Otherwise, this will just, it will fester and get worse. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to try one more time. Can people hear me? No. Is any, can anyone hear me? Yes. All oh, right. Okay, good. So um, uh, thank, thank you for that. I was actually at the meeting with uh, on Friday with um, with the MP and um, holding this health. Sorry, Paula. No, no. Okay. Simply not working, I'm afraid. No. I don't know whether uh, Dr. Jeffries can read your mind and be your mouthpiece, but it's certainly not working, I'm afraid, where you um, are today. Yes, Paula was saying she was actually at the meeting. Now, I must admit I wasn't, so she will have more details. We work very close with all the practices but with, with Holderness Health as our practice our biggest practice their their phone system their, their chief executive has an estates plan she comes to us regularly um, she will be looking at, at new phone systems I know they have recently upgraded uh, but the demand has gone up so much that even with their new system which would have been fit for purpose is now is now not quick enough um, I, I know Amalia Booker well, I know she will be looking at all these things, but I'm, I'm not close enough to that detail as these are really internal practice issues. Um, maybe Will knows uh, more of what Holderness Health are up to, but I know that they will be planning for the future. They, they, they're they a very, yeah. very uh, well-organised practice and they will have a plan with an excellent chief executive. I mean, there's... Thank you, Dr. Jeffers. There are various things they're looking at. There is an estate. There is, again, they're landlocked in the estate in Hedden in particular. As you said, there's opportunities in Withensee, so there's opportunities to look at there about, you know, if you do need to expand in Withensee, there, there is the hospital next door, so there's conversations are, are ongoing. But they are looking at, uh, uh, you know, trying to expand their capacity and they're drawing up plans they're working with architects they're working with local provider who do who helps them with the detail of a plan and they're looking at, at a solution for this so they can create that capacity what they need is extra resources so what you're describing is there's too much demand to meet the capacity so the bottleneck unfortunately is the telephone system so that we can have conversations with them about telephone system but they have just put a new one in which was should have been able to handle this so we need to keep talking to the practice about what, what what they need and see if we can bring some it support in there with our local it providers or net telephone network providers should i say 
we need to understand the causes. Demand's just gone through the roof. I know we just had a pandemic and there's a backlog of people who had routine, you know, health checks, had long-term condition, uh, bloods taken, all this. So it, we've got a bit of a spike in terms of demand coming through. We also under, need to understand why there's so many people actually on the phone more than there was before. And a lot of this is driv driven by other elements within the NHS system that are backlogged and uh, really, really busy. So, for example, I know that practices are getting inundated with telephone calls from patients chasing up outpatient appointments that haven't come through or haven't been confirmed yet. So, again, a call to a, uh, to a practice means that the practice then has to call the hospital, then has to call back the patient when they've gone out. So that whole chain is very long and, and comes from patients are chasing up uh, test results and stuff like that that are coming through. So they're all blocking up, which again, we need to find a way of maybe dealing with these differently so we can take the traffic off the telephones system. So those patients with a need to see a GP or need to have a consultation with one of the allied healthcare professionals can get through, can get seen that day, and that'll take the noise out of it. I think it is very emotive. I talked to one of the GPs yesterday and he was very upset about the fact there's a protest because it, it's reputational damage. It's, uh, it's, you know, they take it very, very personally. And I just say, there's got to be a more constructive way we can do this and, you know, where we can talk with patient participation groups and what have you, just, you know, to try and get a better understanding to, to get the communication better with the practice and all that. So, you know, I'm happy to get involved in any of that sort of thing. But I think we need to... Several things there. Telephone system we can look at. You've got to understand the bigger picture than just primary care, which is which is causing problems on primary care. And then you know we will we continue to talk to Holders Health and offer as much support as we can. Um, Councillor Tucker, are, are you happy with responses so far? I am indeed. I know my fellow ward councillor, Councillor Holmes, yeah. has been putting hand up for a while, okay. so I'll give way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Holmes. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question really centres around what Councillor Tucker has said, that the reality of what we see on the ground and the experience of residents doesn't match up to that what, which we're being told here and what we read in reports uh, and that we heard at the meeting last night. Um, uh, and so I, I had submitted a question in writing to the CCG for their AGM last night. Um, but when the question was read, uh, it was read very differently. It had been very much diluted. And in fact, part of it had been taken out. And the part of it that had been taken out concerned the CCG's assessment of the situation and the support that the CCG could give. Uh, and so um, if I can, before I come to the question itself, if I can just explain why we'd asked it. Um, Holderness Health, had 22,932 appointments in the period of April to June of 2021. That's information from the surgery itself. 3,301 were seen face-to-face -face, and 19,631 were on the, uh, on the telephone. Now, 3,301 amounts to 17%. So 17% of those who needed an appointment uh, were seen face to face. That means 83 um, did not amount to uh, having a clinical need from what we've heard today. Now the website of Holderness Health says telephone appointments can be made by ringing the surgery or via patient access. Once you have been booked in, you will be called back by a clinician who will manage your care via telephone or video consultation. Only in exceptional circumstances will you be asked to attend the surgery for a face-to-face -face appointment. Now, this has two effects, um, really, because um, exceptional circumstances, uh, does that amount to clinical need? Are we really saying that there wasn't a clinical need to see 83% of people who felt that they needed to see a doctor? And is it taken into account when assessing if there's a clinical need, the confidence of the patient in the diagnosis that they receive? Because if they speak to somebody on the phone and they're not offered a face-to-face -face appointment and they don't have confidence in the advice that they receive, the first thing they're gonna do 
is overload the telephone system again to try and book another appointment because they don't have that confidence. Uh, to contrast the situation with pre-COVID, in October to December of 2019, the surgery had 8,399 appointments, 6,702 of which were face-to-face, -face, that's 80%, and 1,697, that's 20%, were over the telephone. Now, of course, one thing you, that you will have noticed is that the number of appointments required have doubled, more than doubled. And so we can see that there is a very, very heavy demand on the doctor's surgery because it's more than doubled. But that may be caused by other things, not just COVID. Uh, it could be because people are rebooking appointments because they don't have confidence in it. Uh, it could be because the number to get a face-to-face -face appointment you have to have the telephone triage first and so that counts as two appointments uh, and they confirmed that that was how it was in the data and so knowing now that only 17 percent are being assessed as meeting that exceptional circumstances the question that i had posed for the ccg is that given that the What Matters to You engagement undertaken April to June of 2021, evidence that being seen and treated as quickly as possible was most important to people. Do the CCG consider this to meet an acceptable standard of care, one that telephone triage takes place three weeks after the initial point of contact, because at the moment, pre-booked appointments are running at three weeks in advance if you can get one, and two, that residents are told to ring back tomorrow if no appointment's available, uh, when they might be told the same thing the following day or the day after that. And that patients should only be seen in exceptional circumstances that's amounting to 17%. If the CCG do not regard any of these to meet an acceptable standard of care, what action or support do the CCG propose to ensure that residents receive the acceptable standard? Uh, and I compare with what Councillor Tucker said, that to see that protest uh, in our town was deeply upsetting for us. Uh, and we understand that it's deeply upsetting for doctors and nurses and all NHS staff. Uh, and so this question, as it was posed, was posed very specifically to ask for the CCG's take on the situation because we don't yeah. intend to criticise in any way those hardworking doctors and nurses and members of staff, but something does need to be done. And so I'd like to know what the CCG's answer to that question would be, but I'd also like to know why it being submitted in writing, was it diluted to read, is there a minimum standard patients can expect and when will we see GP practices return to normal service provision? Because that turned the focus of the question away from the CCG and towards the GP's practice. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. Um, so I'll, I'll take that. The, um, I mean, the figures do show the incredible demand that is put on GPs at the moment. Um, and it isn't, it isn't possible to see that number face to face. You're quite right. And it is a problem that GPs have been discussing is that if you have a phone call and then need to see somebody, it is two appointments. Um, but at, at the moment, um, at, at the moment we're going through a sort of a blended or transitional approach. A, mo a lot of practices now for certain things are saying patients can come straight in. They're in a lot of cases you need a phone call maybe some advice given under a face-to-face -face review say a week later or two weeks later but interestingly your face-to-face -face appointments were not that different in the two the two years that you quoted it is up to the individual GP or practitioner to decide uh, with that patient if a face-to-face -face review is is needed so the the CCG doesn't interfere in that individual clinical decision. Um, many patients like the fact that a lot of things can be done over the phone because they don't have to take time off work, they don't have to find childcare. So, so that is a very individual um, decision as to wh when a patient may, means a face-to-face -face and it is a, cl a clinical decision. Um, and it, it will be based, I know the website says exceptional circumstances, but that will be for the clinician 
to decide. Um, and at the moment, there is a blended approach, and that's national guidance. We can't go back in any GP surgery to people walking in for all face to face because we, at the moment, healthcare settings still have to uh, obey the two meter rule. And I'm sure you all know how busy waiting rooms used to be, and it would be impossible to maintain the two meter distance um, with um, five to 10 minute appointments. So that's why phone is used first. Um, the going back to normal is an interesting phase. I don't think it will ever be like before the pandemic. This is a, a, a time when we're all changing rapidly. Um, and actually, many patients don't want to go back to how it was before the pandemic. But it is at the moment in a difficult time in that we're finding out a balance between all the different ways of accessing healthcare um, and um, you know, sometimes it works and occasionally it doesn't work. If individual patients have a problem, they need to contact the seat. Well, they need to go through the practice uh, procedures first because that's the best way to talk it through with your practice. If they're unhappy with that, they can come through the contact us um, um, portal at the CCG uh, and we can look into it and we work with practices to help resolve these issues. And I hope we never see a protest like that. It was very upsetting um, uh, for everyone. And, and uh, yeah, I would really, really not, not ever want to see anything like that. And like I say, as upset, uh, you know, my colleagues greatly. I'm assuming that the people that marched did out of sheer utter frustration at the declination of services within that area. But um, Councillor Holmes, do you want to continue, please? I, I, I'm sorry if, if my question as I've posed it today wasn't clear. Um, the question that I was asking was why a written question that focused on the CCG was amended to move that focus away from the CCG back to the GP's practice. Because the re re reason for the question was some do like the blended system, but some can't use it and some don't have confidence in it and so the how, the focus of the question was how can we ensure that those who can't use the blended system that it doesn't suit aren't left behind without health care the word normal wasn't used by me that's the word that it was diluted to by the ccg and so i'd like to know why the ccg chose to move the focus from the CCG to the doctor's practice uh, and what the CCG are going to do to ensure that the most vulnerable in society are not left behind by this blended system. It, the, the practice uh, decides you know, how to deliver the services and, and we do work very closely with the practices. We, um, if, like I say, if sorry, the patient's Cam unhappy... Sorry, Do Dr Jeffers, I, I think Councillor Holmes is basically wanting to know why someone, and we need to know who that person was, why, why that person fundamentally altered the question to deflect criticism, shall we say, or operational quality from the CCG to a GP surgery. That's the question that's being asked. And it seems to me you're not answering it. So I'd like you to answer it, please. This, we had many questions and they were they were grouped together because we only had a set amount of time for the CCG. So I'm sorry if the councillor felt the, the thrust of her question was lost. However, we don't we don't operate practices. Uh, if a patient feels that they've been through their practice systems and they are not satisfied, then they come to us and I they must do operate, that. I know you don't operate practices, but as I understand it, you are responsible for delivering the quality of GP services throughout the East Riding of Yorkshire. Am I correct? We, we monitor quality of all our providers. Are you but responsible? We, we, are you responsible? It's, it's, well, it's jointly responsible. We, we monitor it. Um, we do. We step in in an addict when when practices are inadequate. But even then, it is up to the GPs to come up with the, an action plan. Holderness Health is not in that group. I have okay. to stress Holderness right. Health is not in that Dr. group. Dr. Jeffries, it, it seems to me that basically every GP service within the East Riding of Yorkshire at the moment in time, the telephone systems are inadequate. So what actually happens is people are waiting to get 
to get in contact. They either lose out or they don't get the correct service. So they end up not going to the GP services because half the time you can't get a face-to-face -face appointment. So what they do is they decide then to go to a &E, and that is where the issues, to my mind, lie. So my understanding is, is that the CCG are responsible for uh, ensuring that the deliver, delivery of uh, health services are up to a certain standard, together with the Care Quality Commission. And I, I, I fail to see why, um, given the fact that someone answered, put together, took time to put a certain question together, that it was convenient that those questions were then lumped together to make an amorphous, an amorphous question without, it, it, it just seems to me that you've not answered the question, please. I'm, I'm just, it, it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's very difficult. We, we cannot step into a practice and say, buy a new telephone system. We know that Holderness Health have invested a lot of money in IT. Our IT department does support them, but they also work closely with telephone providers. Unfortunately, the new system that they bought we nobody foresaw the demand as it is and it needs upgrading again and we we can help them with planning but we, we do, th this is not at a threshold where the cqc would say that this practice is inadequate at all um, though we do appreciate the frustrations patients have in getting through on the telephone which is why we are also trying to encourage patients to use other other methods of communicating with the practice if if possible uh, you know fully allowing for the fact that many people uh, don't like to use online methods but it is a possibility and everyone that does email in a query of course frees up a few minutes on the telephone lines um, but um, we we monitor the overall quality but not in the specific detail though we've had a lot of um, uh, you know communications with Holderness Health recently as you might imagine as we do with many other practices um, so it's I can't get the, there isn't a more simple answer than that um, and we are supporting the practice um, because of the setback this week um, and um, hopefully things will improve all around in the forthcoming months. Councillor Holmes, are you satisfied or are you happy for someone else to ask a question moving forward? I am, Chair. I know that we've got a lot of work to do. I appreciate that. Right. I'd like uh, Councillor Horton and then Councillor Steele, please, and then Councillor Padden. Yes, thank you. But my questions are a little bit more general than the ones that have been asked so far. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is a little bit crystal ball, but I'm looking for your assurance. Uh, Mr. Ruglow mentioned the general rise in demand for health uh, provision and, and the massive uplift that, that's happened as a consequence of the COVID pandemic. And you're bringing in these new measures, many of them digital, to try and address that demand. Do you honestly feel that maybe in a year, two years, you will really have got this demand under control and perhaps created a little bit of slack in the system, which would be welcome. And the second question I've got, which I think is perhaps even more important, is that do you think the quality of the health outcomes as a consequence of these changes will be at least maintained and maybe even improved in time? And how are you going to measure and show that if, if that's possible to show? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, your question about the uplift um, are we in a year's time, I think it comes back to the comment I made earlier. It's about understanding what the demand is. I mean, lots of demand is at the moment is, is, is consequences of other things within the whole healthcare system. And that's creating lots of, um, lots of the phone calls that are going in, which is blocking up phones, et cetera, et cetera. There is also the low level mental health issues that were, have been generated by the pandemic. I don't think we fully understand what that is at the moment, but we're working with our mental health providers to put in services in, into practices. We're actually, go, we're actually going to trial something in Bridlington. So somebody who phones up and there's one of these patients who phones, you know, daily, you know, trying to see a doctor, which happens a lot. It's not a health issue they've got. It's, it's something else. So what we want to try and do is put some provision into practice, trial putting provision into the practice. So rather than see a GP, they see somebody who can understand what it is, you know, their issue is, 
and then they can take them to whatever services is best for that individual. That unblocks telephone calls and takes some, gives opportunity for GPs not to see these patients on daily or twice, three times a week. Uh, that's just one example. There are other things like the rest of the system hopefully will be better in a better position in terms of waiting lists at hospitals will be reduced. Blood tests will come through. Don't forget, we've also had a problem with blood tests recently. The number of blood bottles are because of uh, the pandemic or other reasons. We've had a shortage of supply, which has just been unblocked. So again, there's people phoning up and rebooking blood appointments. We've had the huge pandemic, which has been incredibly successful across the East Riding, fourth best in the country or third best in the country, higher percentage nationally first, higher percentage of second. And that's all been delivered by your primary care. Your primary care teams that look after you has been delivering this service. So they've delivered that. That has taken GPs, that has taken nurses, that has taken admin away from frontline services whilst dealing with the enormity of the rise that we discussed as well. So there's a lot of factors that may have dissipated, you know, waiting lists come down, the pandemic not being there, greater concentration of primary care, getting back to what it is, they, you know, core GP, GP and core primary care services. There's a lot of things that can happen and there's been a lot of things in play, which I think has been overlooked and, you know, over time forgotten the, about this. So will we deliver a slack? I don't know is the honest answer, but I think we'll be a lot, a lot further, a little better position, either one, to developing systems that will look better, or two, having you know just a bit of slack in the system with people looking at stuff. Everything we're describing is the right things to do in this paper. They are the right things to do given the thing we've got. What we are struggling for, we haven't got a magic wand that can just magic all these new uh, clinicians or new roles and stuff like this. We've got great plans, but we do need resources to come in and help deliver it. Um, I think communication could be better. And I think examples that you've all given about websites. Now, yes, we can look at that. We can, we can help practice with that sort of thing. And I think it's just dialogue. I think we've got to get back to talking to PPGs and finding ways of, you know, better, better communicating with people, either digitally or, you know, we've had the conversations before how we can do that. Um, so will we be in a better position? I'd like to think so, yes, if we hold our nerve and continue doing what we're doing and we get a bit of luck, if you know what I mean, that we, the pandemic doesn't blow up over, over the winter and what have you, so when we go backwards. But there's been, a, you know, I hope that answers your question to a degree or give you some assurances, Councillor Horton. Yes, yes, it, it certainly does in terms of the demand issue. Perhaps a little bit more on the quality issue. Obviously, all these new changes coming in, these digital changes. I know it's difficult to track cause and effect. Will you be able, if, if these do make an improvement, will you be able to show that these have made an improvement yeah. in clinical outcomes? We have key, key performance indicators which demonstrate the quality of service for all aspects of the health service, including primary care. So we know how we're performing now, how we know we performed a year ago. So it, it's trackable. So if, if it drops or goes up, we will be able to see it through the KPIs we have. OK, thank you. Councillor Steele. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, it was good to hear that you're looking at improved premises for head, and I think that may solve some of our problems, especially the queuing that's still going on outside. We're coming into the winter again, so hopefully, I can't see you having the building ready before then, but hopefully we'll have a solution to avoid this queuing. Um, coming to the questions raised today, <clears throat> sorry for my throat. Um, through I've been contact, contacted by a number of residents who have had difficulties getting appointments with the head and group practice. Now, they stress that they're not complaining about the staff. You know, they're doing a great job under difficult circumstances, and they should be especially congratulated for the sterling work they're doing in delivering the vaccination programme. It's not about the staff, it's about the system. We've already heard today the alternatives trying to access online or by the telephone system is not working correctly. Um, I've had one or two cases where They've ended up calling 101. 101 has said, we'll get the GP. The GP will call you back today. Those callbacks haven't happened. And the condition's gone on. It's gone on to the point where they're ending up using the a &E department. That is not something we want to happen. This is something that we tried to um, <clears throat> sort out a few years ago. We don't want to go back down that route. So the alternative systems need to be improved 
approved, as I think you've indicated. But also I have in my hand here a letter from <clears throat> to all GPs from NHS England. This was in May this year, talking about improving the offer of face-to-face -face appointments and practices should respect the preference for face-to-face -face appointments. Now, clearly, <clears throat> because of COVID, you're trying to keep the distances, may only be able to happen in larger practices, perhaps not at head and group. But I wonder whether this has actually been taken note of at all, and is it being looked at, and are you trying to implement that guidance? So um, I think that's all I've got to ask for at the moment. I've got plenty of other issues, but I'd welcome some answers to those points. Thank you. The letter that you um, mentioned was, was widely circulated to GPs, and yes, has been taken account of, and practices are offering the blended approach. But we cannot offer everyone face to face appointments, as I mentioned before, and actually many patients don't want to come in, um, either because of infection or... Dr. Jeffries, for some reason, we can't... It's very difficult to hear you now, suddenly. I don't know what's altered. No, I... Uh, well... Um, Paula South is now with me. We were hoping to get both of us using one machine. It's 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 actually gone worse since. <laughs> it's it's got it's actually got worse now. I'm afraid. Hello. Sorry. Hello. That's yes, better. we can uh, we can definitely hear you okay. now. Okay, we'll have, right, so just to, Paula South is now sat with me, but we're going to have to take it in turns to use the headset because that's how you're getting the good sound. Okay, so I was just saying the letter that has just been referred to was widely circulated to GPs was most definitely taken account of a lot of discussion. And as far as we know, all practices are offering a blended uh, approach. We cannot offer everyone face to face appointments. Uh, a, a lot of patients don't want to come in. Uh, they may be worried about infection or uh, it's just more convenient for them. But the, there is a discussion between the doctor and the patient. And that's when the decision is made whether or not a face to face appointment um, is uh, needed. Um, and um, it is, as I said before, a bit of a transition period at the moment. Um, and we hope that in a year's time, things will be more settled. Um, the outcomes that are measured are sort of disease specific. You know, we look at mortality for cancer, um, outcomes from strokes, and all these are uh, collected on a national basis. There is some concern, actually, that there will be a dip um, and an increase in, in morbidity and mortality system wide, nationwide, because of the effects of the, the COVID pandemic has had on the health service. And this um, this is, it isn't a good state of affairs, but it's not specific to East Riding. Um, this is going to be a national uh, problem and there is a lot of planning going on to manage the backlog to increase um, healthcare. It's very difficult when you've got a nationwide recruitment crisis and a huge workforce problem, um, which is why each individual person is working harder and harder, which in the last 18 months have been incredibly stressful for the NHS staff you know we have never had to manage anything like this before and people are getting exhausted which is one reason why the protest that happened on Holderness was so deeply upsetting when you have staff that have given their all um, and then this sort of thing happens and unfortunately we will we will all need a little bit more patience. And I know that's not maybe what you want to hear, but we are all working flat out um, and doing the best we can. Um, we need just a little more patience um, and we would be really grateful if you could support us in that. Councillor Steele, are you? Happy or any more additional questions before we hand over to Councillor Pan? Well, I don't know if it's questions as such, but I, I didn't feel like my concerns were very well addressed. Um, you know, we have patients who are getting very concerned about the, the health situation and, you know, turning up to A&E and turning up late and to a point where the outcome for an individual was worse, they should have been seen sooner. You know, it's just... Uh, where are we going? I just feel very uncomfortable about the whole situation. It just is as if the, the system is broken and it needs fixing. And it's not about the staff at the sharp end. It's not about the doctors and nurses. It seems to be about the lack of the technical, technological things that you're trying to implement that aren't working properly. If we just get those working, maybe it would be a bit of an improvement. 
I, I can't have any more. more. Thank you. Councillor Pan. Uh, I agree with my colleague. My question is, I've been hearing rumours that the CCG, which I do believe there is four, are being amalgamated into one. Uh, is this a rumour or is this true, please? Oh, hello. Uh, this is Paula South. I'm now on Dr. Jeffrey's um, headset. Um, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, just about. Oh, okay, good, good. So, um, so, uh, so Councillor Padden, I think I heard a question around CCG's merging. Uh, yes, I'll repeat the question. I've heard rumours for the last four or five months, or somebody who I believe in what they say, is the CCG are amalgamating themselves from four down to one. Uh, is this a true fact? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Padden. So, um, um, the committee may well be aware of our um, changes, uh, imminent changes to the architecture of the NHS, where we are moving um, towards uh, an integrated care system um, model. That integrated care system for here will be uh, across Humber Coast and Vale. So that will, in effect, be um, six GP practices. I'm sorry, uh, uh, CCG um, CCGs that will that will actually move into an integrated care system. Um, so that uh, legislation is, is going through Parliament at the moment, and assuming that it goes all the way through, and there's no suggestion that it won't, um, that will happen on the first of April. 2022. Um, we will then all work together along really, really closely, much more closely with local authorities um, on, um, on with a focus on place. So for, for although East Riding CCG won't exist from the 1st of April 2022, um, uh, the, the law, uh, you know, assuming the law is passed, then uh, we will work um, at East Riding Place closely with our local authority partners, um, our other NHS providers, the, um, the, the uh, uh, voluntary sector uh, and other key players with a real focus on population health management for, so for in East Riding, for East Riding, but as a body, we won't exist from the 1st of April um, 2022. Um, uh, Councillor Padden, you may well have heard of, 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 a, of what we're calling a, um, a, a strategic partnership. So because the Humber Coast and Vale footprint is quite large, um, we have divided, we are divided into um, two strategic partnerships and the strategic partnership for the Humber is for four CCGs. Now we still operate as individual CCGs, but we come together when it makes sense to do so in relation to key areas of work. And so it may well have been the Humber strategic partnership element that you've heard in terms of the four into one. But can I just say in terms of the sovereignty of CCGs, they remain standalone until the, in the 1st of April 2022. But actually at times it does make sense to work more closely together and particularly for East Riding working across with Hull. And so where it does make sense, we do that. Um, but, but we're still entities in our own right for the time being. Uh, I thank you for that. Um, can I just put across to you that it is rather alarming besides people uh, demonstrating on the street <clears throat> the headlines from the Prime Minister saying we must have more face to face and the papers are telling us how about we go and get an appointment to see our doctors don't you think that's a rather a disgrace in relation to so I, I think I, I think uh, Dr Jeffries and, and, and Will has have had uh, a really good go at describing the circumstances that we're in at the moment and um, the mitigations we're, we're, we're going to put in place. So I don't want to uh, replicate any of that. What, what I would say, the probably things I would add to what's already been said is um, we'd like to hear about any individual concerns. So if people are individually on an individual basis are concerned, um, then either um, as Dr Jeffries said to uh, directly to their own GP or to the CCG, um, and we can we have a dedicated email address that we can put up um, to be able to uh, for those concerns to come come into and we'll have a look at them and then on a sort of a, a more a, a, on a more strategic footprint we have asked uh, uh, Will to do a piece of work around looking at um, uh, the the 
issue of access for all practices. So, so in terms of a mapping exercise about where our hotspots are, where it's working well, where we need to improve. Clearly, we've talked today about areas that we need to improve. Um, I, I think there was a comment about um, everybody's telephone system isn't fit for, fit for purpose. I guess I would sit here today and say, I'm not sure that I would agree with that. We, we haven't got that level of detail. So we've asked um, Will to do a, a piece of work around that and he'll start that off shortly and we'll be able to see what's on, what, what's on practices websites, what the uh, appointment systems look like and then where we as a CCG can support uh, individual practices to improve. So that was the second thing I'd like to say. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I, I know I, I'm, I'm hogging this a bit, but um, the councillor, and I, I didn't see who it was who was really concerned about the AGM um, the AGM questions I'd like to have just pick a conversation up outside of here if they would like to do that unless you want me to address that now but I'm, I'm minded that the conversation has moved on so but I would like to I would like to have a chat with her about that Thank you I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that will happen thank you very much indeed Thank you Are you happy Councillor Pardon? Okay uh, like Councillor Jefferson please, and then immediately after that, Councillor Davison. But just as a, an aside, I've just been given a note that tells me that Dr Mitchell's North Ferriby surgery closed 18 months ago for new members. He is definitely open. We will chase that up, um, oh, Will and I. Okay, will... we've just been assured um, that it actually closed uh, 18 months ago. So who, who clearly... Let you... Who Clearly told you that information? I'm, well, I, I, I will. I'll get Councillor Tucker will be in contact with you immediately afterwards with the source of that information. But okay. clearly, there's a there's a difference of a of opinion here. So, anyway, I'll pass you on to Councillor Jefferson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mine is a tiny bit more like a statement, which I'm sure you're all quite used to. And there are odd questions here and there. PCNs are maybe offering excellent service, as quoted by Will. And Dr. Jenny said, however, uh, this is excellent service to everyone. I would disagree because it depends if you've actually experienced some of the experiences that some of our residents have had, and they are your patients. Here on the ground, we're not feeling this. And I'm sorry today is such a long, disappointing day. Again, uh, Dr. Jenny mentioned, we have been told money are in, uh, sorry, many are internal issues. Staff, telephone services, etc. Have you any explanation as to how you are able to monitor and give us further assurances now and in the future? That's one question. You've also said normality would return maybe in a year's time. You see, I listen to your presentations as well as reading my agenda. And I wonder what you think about now. Patients are here now. Maybe they will not be here to enjoy this good news if they do not get to see their GPs. Would you not agree? A question. Then, whole Royal Infirmary is triaging patients and sending them away to go to their doctors to make appointments where necessary. Can this continue? Because it's like a table tennis set that we're having at the moment for patients who are ill. Will you have any input into that by saying to the GP surgeries, in fact, if they've been to Hull Royal Infirmary, can you not look at this? After all, this must be terrible to go there and be told, go home, ring your doctor's surgery, especially perhaps for an elderly person or a mother with a child that is Poorly. Would you be able to say you have an input? That is a question I'm asking anyone who's got any empathy at all about some of the people that we are trying to look after. Or who would you suggest that we go to? 
Thank you. Dr. Jeffers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you, Councillor Bowman. Could, could I could I just ask a, a, a request um, of the committee? Um, so, so Dr. Anne Jeffries um, uh, has been called several uh, under several different names today. So, so, so her preference would be to re to be referred to as Dr. Jeffries, please, if that's possible. Um, that would be um, if, if if that can be um, if the committee can be um, can do that. That would be helpful. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I should have said Dr. Jeffries. I do apologise to you, Dr. Jeffries, um, but I just have you down here as, as uh, Dr. Anne Jeffries. Uh, I shouldn't have been personal, but perhaps you could be good enough to answer some of those questions because they were in what you were saying to this committee. Oh, do I yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Jefferson. Shall I start and then hand over to Dr. Jeffries? Is that would that be acceptable? Provided I hear from Dr. Jeffrey. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's sitting next to me. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry about about the uh, the difficulties today uh, around sound. So, so um, I've I've written a few things down, but I will start. So, I think um, th there was some discussion around the, how we monitor um, and are assured around um, uh, what I'd broadly call quality in primary care. And again, I don't want to go over something that's already been said. But what I would, you know, just point out to the committee that we've got two. We've got two ways of doing that. So our, our external regulators called the CQC, Care Quality Commission, they have the uh, regulatory responsibility to oversee um, uh, the provision of primary care in, in, in terms of making sure it's safe uh, and fit for purpose. And we know uh, uh, in terms of our practices in East Riding, um, they are mostly almost completely um, green for good. So we know that the, C the CQC's um, uh, rating for, for our practices mostly is green. Um, what are you doing about the ones that aren't mostly green? Then? So, I, so it is, I would say, um, off the top of my head, there's probably one, maybe two practices where there is a requires improvement, probably one or two out of um, 29 practices. And when we get a requires improvement um, uh, rating from the CQC, then we have a quality team within the CCG who will um, work closely with the practice um, to produce an action plan because the CQC will expect an action plan as to how that practice is will going to improve and we support them in that. There'll be specific areas of improvement. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing to say, the other arm of that, is quite, which is quite rightly pointed out today, is around um, our, our responsibility as a CCG to support primary care to deliver quality services. So um, that, that is all the things that Will and Dr. Jeffries have talked about today in terms of the, the ongoing support that we would give them. And also, as, as uh, uh, Council Jefferson, you've quite rightly said we also have a role in assuring ourselves that all is well um, and so we do have something called the primary care commissioning committee where we look at um, how we can overall support primary care um, be cognizant of the areas that we may well need to um, um, ask practices to improve so I just wanted to set out that because I think that seems to be in a bit of a theme all the way through um, I think you also talked about um, the second part of, uh, of your questions was around Hull Royal, Royal Infirmary and did we have an input into that and the answer to that question is yes. So as a CCG we look at a system, um, the whole uh, NHS system and so we do work with um, Hull Royal Infirmary, urgent treatment centres, NHS 111 to make sure that there is an offer for, for patients um, who need same day care. So that might be go to A&E but that might not be, um, you know, they may go to any that might not be um, clinically appropriate but there may well be another offer there which might be um, a, 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 an, a, a, an appointment with, with a doctor's within two hours if that is um, out of hours or at weekends and that, and that can be arranged a pharmacy appointment that can that can be that can be um, uh, agreed um, or, or some self-care so there is a whole there is, is a whole menu of things that um, that, that can be offered if if actually patients who attend an A and E it is not um, it is not uh, necessary to do so. Having said that, um, uh, the, the triage is uh, the clinical triage is is very robust, and no patient would be turned away if there was a clinical need for them to be in, in, in ED. But those people who assume they have a clinical need, yeah, possibly with a small child, yeah. 
they are told to go home and to ring up their doctor's surgery, the GP surgery. And you know, and I know, you've heard nothing else for the last two hours except the fact that people can't get through to their surgery um, because of the so busy, so busy. That is not an excuse that's acceptable. I'm sorry. As far as I'm concerned, if you've got somebody that's ill, they need help. And please don't tell me today, ring 111, because I've already had one of my residents had a problem after 35 minutes told, ring your doctor's surgery. I don't understand what, what you're actually doing or achieving with our doctor's surgery, because it seems to me sitting here, all of us are saying, the doctor's surgery are having a really, really hard time. And I just wondered what kind of help you're actually putting in there to support them. Yes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jefferson. I would agree with you, and I don't think anybody on this call today would disagree that actually doctor's surgeries are having a really hard time. I think we've described the increase in demand um, that clearly uh, is being demonstrated today, and uh, plus against the backdrop of um, needing to deliver the uh, COVID vaccine programme and um, very shortly the flu programme, and that immense pressure that is put on primary care and the impact of that on them and on their patients. So I, I don't think we disagree with that at all, and we are we are working as hard as we can to support them uh, and I think Dr Jeffries has been clear about the things that we are doing in terms of encouraging working in a different way being innovative um, encouraging digital access um, and those sorts of things as well as face-to-face -face appointments so a blended approach is actually um, a, a options for people some of whom uh, may well as Dr. Jeffrey said, prefer to have a uh, have a telephone call with the GPs. Not all, I absolutely agree with you. And for those patients, then a a face to face appointment should always be on the table. And you'll see from the letter that um, that you referred that one of the can your councillors referred to that Dr. Jeffrey's answered is that there is an expectation that face to face appointments will be offered, and they are being offered in our view. Um, clearly, there is a, a strong feeling uh, in the chamber today around the amount amount of face-to-face um, -face appointments and I think we need to increase our understanding somewhat of that in terms of um, how people feel on the ground uh, so that's something that I, I'm going to ask Will to take away and do. And perhaps could you ask Dr Jeffries if she would answer yes. why she feels that yes perhaps in a year's time things will be better because that is of no use to people now and here, going out to their residents and saying, well, in a year's time, it's going to be fine. We all know about COVID. We all know about what we've gone through it. We've all, we've all suffered the same. And staff have worked terribly, terribly hard to catch up. But what I'm saying to you now is that kind of remark to me was quite offensive in the fact that in a year's time, well, actually, if I'm ill now, what will a year's time do for me? I might not be here. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. If you are ill now, you will receive the care that you need. Um, and surgeries and hospitals are prioritising the acutely unwell. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic it isn't over. There are, there are more people in hospital now than there were a few months ago with COVID. Plus, we have the backlog. And this is why all, all sections of the health service, and general practice is the most public facing, but all sections of the health service are under such pressure at the moment. But if you are acutely unwell, you will, but you will receive the care that you need it will take it will take time as I mentioned before we are going out to recruit there is a, re a huge workforce problem quite often practices put adverts out and get no applicants you know and that the CCG helps to, with publicity um, that there's um, work streams across the whole Humber, Humber Coast and Vale to look for new staff there aren't the staff there so we have to work with what we've got and that unfortunately means that uh, only the really acutely unwell at the moment will be seen and we have to work through the backlog in a clinically safe and effective manner. Lots of prioritisation work going on, but patients will be seen. Um, and it is difficult at the moment, but everyone is working to the best of their ability. We have a long term plan as well. Um, and practices are going out to look for these new roles, but they it takes time to embed new staff into any team. 
Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Davison, Phil, and then uh, Councillor Holmes, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, it, it, so it sort of carries on from uh, where uh, Councillor Jefferson's uh, comments were made. <clears throat> Somebody informed me the other day that there'd been um, the results of a patient satisfaction survey published. Six and a half thousand uh, GP practices, I understand. Now, um, I'm just wondering what the CCG does. Well, I think we've had part of the answer there. Um, when it finds that one of my ward's GP practices is in the bottom 500 of that six and a half thousand. Um, and uh, my ward is Hesel, so maybe you can work that one out. Um, and I'm just wondering, I'm not being specific, I'm not naming particular practice, but um, I think um, <clears throat> Paula has given us some reflection of how, how you can assist, and that's really what I'm looking at, to improve the reputation that a particular GP practice has achieved, which is not good. And uh, this has gone on before COVID as well. So um, what are you doing about it? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Davison. So I, I, I think, so um, Dr. Jeffries and I are sharing a headset, which is quite difficult and, and trying to socially distance at the same time. Um, I, I, I think your question was around how we support in practices who need to improve. Uh, in, in, uh, as per um, the patient survey, is that right? So, so I think that patient survey has just been um, just been um, published, and it's an annual thing. Um, so, any anything that that came out of that patient survey that um, practices would ask us needed to um, would would uh, whether we'd need help in relation to improving or or, or developing or, or anything in particular that they think they could that we could help with, they would ask us, and we would. Um, we would help them absolutely. Um, it doesn't have um, uh, any uh, mandatory um, interventions that we would need to do in terms of a CCG, but clearly we it's a, a, a one of a number of um, sources of intelligence that we use to understand what the quality of our uh, primary care services are like across East Riding. I think this one particular practice in Hesel is the CCG does know, and we're working with the CQC and the quality team I was going, going into the practice to support the practice, and we have been doing that for at least a year, going into the practice to try and stabilise the practice and try and uh, put, we're aware of it, to put it that way, and we're working very close with the practice, try and stabilise the practice and then try and improve services for patients in, within there. So it was on, it's known to the CCG and we are working with them. Oh, so thank you, Will. I, I now I'm aware. I think of the practice that we're referring to. Wouldn't necessarily want to name that practice, but I think um, uh, it, it's, it's one of those one yeah. of, of the two practices um, in East Riding that we are working closely with to uh, with an improvement plan. Um, and so there's there's a, there's a lot of input. Uh, they're working alongside that practice. Um, so thanks, Will, for letting me know, uh, telegraphing to me yeah. who that is. Thank you for that. It gives me some assurance. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, Councillor uh, Holmes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, you've told us that one of the things that you have been doing to support practices is by promoting, for example, the diverse ways that you can uh, contact your doctor's surgery. And um, I think we can all agree that it has um, been a period of great change because it's needed to be. And I think there's a gap in communicating to residents how it's changed and how they can navigate it. And I just wonder if one way that the CCG could support um, doctors' practices is by producing uh, a guide for residents as to how to now navigate their uh, primary care services um, after this period of great change. So uh, like a flowchart that residents can follow you know what is the problem this is the service that you need to access so they've got all the telephone numbers there in, in one place they're signposted to other services that they can use for uh, problems uh, and what numbers that, that they can use to do that other ways that they can do that online for example 
it, I think that would be useful for residents so that they've got a very helpful yeah. guide as to how to navigate these services, but also it would help the doctor's practices because a lot of, a lot of them won't have individuals um, who are paid to concentrate on communications. And so they're putting those resources into communicating with people, um, but they, they, those people could go usefully do something else within the practice if that burden can be uh, lifted a little bit. So I just wonder if that's something that could be considered a, a useful guide for residents. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. I think that's a really good idea. Uh, really good idea. I, I agree with you that our practices don't have their own in, don't have their own individual communication teams. We do have an in-house communication team um, in East Ride in CCG, and um, I would happily take that away as an action to um, to produce something. It may well be um, that that we would touch base with people to see if it's sort of hitting the mark, um, but by way of maybe testing it before it goes far and wide. And so um, we will certainly do that as well. But yeah, thank you for that for that uh, idea. Yeah, and Councillor Holmes, it builds on the website work we need to do because a website would be a great place to hang this information. There'll be nuances for each individual PCN about where, where they refer to different numbers. So to make it easier, if you just have the information for each practice on their website or communicated by other routes, I think it's an excellent idea. That's definitely one we'll... That's Thank you. I, I do agree it would be useful to put it on a website, but a lot of residents don't use the internet. Uh, and so, that, yeah. you know, if they could have a piece of paper that they can stick on the yeah. fridge or on the notice board, so that when they're in a, a, a time that's worrying for them, they're not feeling well, they've got it. It's right there in front of them. We've done the legwork yeah. for them. That's good. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great idea. Uh, Councillor Fox, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, mine's more of a statement with some questions. And I'll start by saying that really the system seems to have broken down. Uh, the first port of call that most people make is by their telephone. And uh, before COVID, we didn't seem to have any problems when we rang our doctor. We, we were all pretty satisfied. So I'll start with Monday to Friday, the doctor's surgery, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. You phone the doctor, you're feeling not well. I have residents that I've done it for as well. So it's always the same system. And so a receptionist or somebody will come on. I have no idea what training they have, but they come on and they'll ask your name. Uh, well, first of all, you'll have your options, one to five. I'll have my option. I want to ring the doctor. Number three, I press. So it's a receptionist or somebody comes on to the other end of the phone. No idea what knowledge they have at all. Sometimes it's a, a woman, sometimes it's a man. And you then have to go give your... Uh, tell him or her what your symptoms are. Well, at one time, as we all know, it were private between you and your doctor, but the system seems to have changed. And if you're not well, well, you give your symptoms. Now, this is what always concerns me. What knowledge have they got? And they're relaying those symptoms to the doctor. So then the doctor gets those, uh, that relayed message from the patient. This is how it always works when I ring. And then you wait to see whether or not you're, you're, you're early enough for the doctor to ring. And I have no data on how many times a doctor will ring back. So I, I, I get concerned about that. Um, what kind of knowledge have these people got who are on that phone asking you what your, what your um, problems are, right? We'll go back then. Well, I'll move on. And we'll go to Saturday and Sundays. Um, right. This is the message you get when you ring the doctor on a Saturday morning because there's no doctor there. If your call is a medical emergency, um, put the phone down and ring 999. I always wonder how many people do that. How many people do ring 999? especially if you're vulnerable and you're on your own, even nobody to tell, tell, maybe they do. Maybe that's why that many ambulances are running around with the uh, blue lights flashing and um, the, the A&E can't cope with all the ambulances that are queuing. So that, that's that one. 
or you ring uh, 111. Well, we've all rung 111 and people complain about it all the time, especially at the weekends. And I once had a problem on it. And I'll be honest with you, in the end, I was so angry because my husband was so ill, I put the phone down and somebody ran back and she did a marvellous job. And I didn't realise there were two doctors in Ghoul Hospital. I had no idea. Anyway, I, I, I did eventually get some help. I got a doctor out to the house. But what I say, us as counsellors, we're used to speaking to people. We're used to putting our foot down. But a lot of people are not. And if you're ill and you're vulnerable, you're not going to get that kind of help, are you? So how I look at it as well, these people on 111, what knowledge have they got? You're telling them your symptoms. They're deciding whether you should be seeing a doctor. So I feel the whole system's broken down. And I feel we should maybe go back to basics. I mean, as things changed since the COVID, that that many people were so afraid, they were so afraid of catching uh, the virus that they never rang a doctor. And is it now... Why the doctor's surgeries, everybody's going crackers on the phone because they've neglected their health. Like a lot of people while this COVID's been on, they've neglected a lot of things, Chairman. So I don't know what the answer is, but all I know, the old system just seems to have broken down and we have to go back to basics and find out just exactly what's happened. So I don't know who would answer me that on what you feel we should do, but that is what's happened. We, the system's broken down. Let's get back to basics. Things seemed fine before. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't know, it, would that be you, Dr. Jeffries, or yourself, or, or yourself, Will? Yeah, no, um, I'm happy to answer, Councillor Fox. Thank if you. That, that's all right. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Um, so um, I th I'll, I'll stick to the specifics about uh, what happens when you speak to the receptionists. Uh, they are receptionists uh, uh, and not clinical staff, um, as mentioned. However, it is helpful if patients will give, a, if they're happy to, a basic idea, and it's not any detail. Uh, sometimes, say a patient is ringing in because they have back pain, a lot of practices now have their own physiotherapists and can immediately divert the appointment away from a GP but to the physiotherapist, instead of speaking to a GP, he'll say you'll need an appointment with a physiotherapist. Uh, likewise, if it's a medication, a query, um, you can go straight to the pharmacist rather than through a GP, he'll say, oh, you need a, a, you know, a thorough review by our pharmacist. So, so a, a broad outline is very useful. Then th th sometimes they ask a few more questions to say, do you need an urgent appointment that day or can it be the next routine? However, any patient can say, I'm not prepared to give you any information. I just want a doctor's appointment and the patient will be given the next routine appointment. Um, but, um, and, and so there is always the option, uh, no patient should feel obliged to give information they don't wish to share. Um, but if they don't share any information, they may not get the appointment that's most suitable for them. That, that, that's the problem. But there's no obligation to give information. To go to the 111 um, uh, call handlers, they, they are not clinicians, but they, have a, they do have training um, to answer this and they work through a very strict protocol. Uh, and they do have to go through a lot of questions because these are all uh, pathways that have been validated by a team of senior clinicians, the national pathways, uh, that are, and they're checked for safety uh, uh, as well as effectiveness for the patient. And so the 111 call handlers work very strictly um, and this is common constantly reviewed. Pathways are constantly reviewed by, um, path, um, by clinicians, especially if there is um, a serious incident. So the more information you give to 111, the, the better. Uh, and they will point you in the direction because they have a huge directory of services uh, and can uh, signpost the patient to the right place or arrange for the right clinician uh, to call them back. Uh, so I would ask that the patients do give as much information to the 111, though it is a long questionnaire. Um, I, I do appreciate that. But that is to make sure a safe decision is reached. Um, as for the whole system, I mean, you, you're quite right. We are under the pressure that we have never been under before, um, as I've mentioned before. Um, and there isn't a magic answer. I'm not going to say tomorrow everybody's going to be 
extremely happy and they're going to walk in and see the GP of their choice uh, with a face to face appointment within 48 hours. That, that would not be true. And I'm not going to um, even give you the impression that that's going to happen. However, we all have to look at this in a, a different way. Um, try and change if we possibly can support those who can't um, and there is a lot of planning going on to make sure that things do improve as hopefully we catch up with the backlog um, and the councillor makes a good point that people didn't contact the um, the health service um, um, so last year last spring and last summer um, and um, uh, and so things have have rumbled on but now everybody wants everything done tomorrow you know, and we all do. Um, um, uh, th there isn't the capacity to do everything tomorrow. So we're having to work through things and we are really trying to do it as safely as possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and um, and it's back to what I said. We, we, we all we all need some patience and we are really trying our best with, with the, the backlog and the catch up uh, to do what we can as quickly as we can. Anything else you'd like to add, Councillor Paul? Yeah, just one question. It did come to me when you were speaking. Um, so what had happened then if a patient decides not to give uh, her, her, his or her symptoms to the person on the phone? <laughs> how do you know? They will, get the uh, they will get the next routine GP appointment. Right, OK, thank you. OK, I'm conscious it's... Uh... 20 to 1 and banging will be resuming any any minute now so I think we've got away with uh, with murder thank you uh, are there any other questions that anybody would like to answer before we go through with uh, some recommendations Councillor Padden uh, I would just like to say that uh, as Councillor Davis would know I've just gone through a traumatic time with myself and I have to be absolutely honest I got the best care you could ever get so I've got no complaints, but we are here as a scrutiny committee to look at the overall scenario we're landed in now. And uh, please don't take anything offensive. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I feel as though today I've been probably slightly more terse than I should have been. So I hope I haven't uh, upset anybody, uh, including uh, Will Poller or uh, Dr. Jeffries. Um, Thank you, thank you, Councillor Bowman. And can I just, just extend my sympathies to Councillor Padden and say thank you for, for his really nice comments? It's a pleasure. I mean, I think, I think we're all passionate about it and um, maybe we do um, become slightly animated more than we should do, but that's only because we've seen um, what it does to our local residents. And at the end of the day, that's what, we, that's what we're here for, to, to make sure that they're okay and, and and to protect them as best we can. So when we see things not working as well as ideally we'd like it to be, um, then we conveniently sometimes forget the fact that we also need money to pay for these and we also need staffing. And we're conscious that, you know, because we are human beings, we get a system put together, starts to work, and then we change it for another system. You know, I mean, CCGs are now going to be changed to something else to be saying something else. So... I'm, I'm not saying it can't, can't be easy from your point of view as well. So um, I'd like to just go through the recommendations. Oh, Yvonne, if, would you like to make a... I know you've been waiting patiently all, all morning. I've not seen your yellow hand yet. So would you, if you'd like to make uh -huh. a comment, no problem. It, it was really a comment. And, I, you know, I've, I've listened really carefully to what's happened this morning. And, and it always makes me um, incredibly proud to work for the council when I see, you know, our councillors scrutinising topics which are really important to, to our residents. I think, you know, I think the comments you just made are really valid. And it is that bit about people become very passionate. But one of the things that occurred to me as, as you've been talking is a lot of the um, issues and the difficulties that potentially people are having are people in our older generations and quite rightly they're the people who use health services um, a great deal but what I would urge people in, in, in the council chambers and beyond to, to remember is that there's been a lot of very positive changes in the way our GP practices work for people of my generation and younger who do use the internet 
So I have access to my medical records. I can go on my mobile phone. I can look at my medical records. And within an hour of being in the GP practice, I can find out what, what the GP is recorded. I have to have regular blood tests. I can go on and check what my blood test results are. I've become quite an expert now at looking up what that means and what that means. Um, and I feel very, very empowered. As I know many, many people I talk to feel about having a hand in your own medical care. Um, and I feel that that's the direction of travel that we need to go. We need to support people who haven't got that ability and that capability. Um, but one day we'll all be doing that. We'll, trust me, we won't want somebody else having all our records. We'll want to see for ourselves. We'll want to be able to see the minute that our test results go onto that system. We'll want to know what it says. And then we can ring the GP and say, this is not normal. Can you do something about it? Or what are you going to do about it? So there have been some really, really brilliant, brilliant things that have emerged out of the changes in GP practices. And, and, I've, and I think everything that's been raised today is really valid. But I would urge us not to forget that um, and to be really able able to promote that with our younger generations of people coming through so that was just what I wanted to say really but a really interesting um, and very very um, stimulating discussion and I do think you know there's been some real positives that have come out this morning and I think you know the fact that um, Councillor Holmes was able to um, make that really helpful suggestion about something that will make a really difficult situation better is, is, is great and I think that's what scrutiny is about isn't it it's about having that open conversation that open dialogue healthy challenge and let's come to some you know some agreements and some things that will make things better so thank you all for this morning and for your time and for um, for listening to me thank you thanks Yvonne um what recommendations have we got then thank you chair um so four really um the first thing was uh the, the, the subcommittee is keen to see the ccg um support surgeries to improve their telephone systems uh the second one uh, was to do with the, the information on GPs' websites uh, and, the, and the accuracy of that, kind of into the third one, which is about communicating to residents uh, clearly about the availability of extended hours appointments um, and sort of how those can be accessed. Uh, and then the fourth one um, on from uh, Councillor Holmes's point uh, about publishing a guide for residents within each PCN area uh, about how to access primary care locally. Thank you. Uh, unless there's any other uh, recommendations that people would like to add, I think uh, I'd like to thank uh, our, our visiting speakers today um, for your time and uh, your efforts. Uh, as I say, it, it was always going to be a fairly uh, detailed and uh, shall we say, slightly more aggressive questioning, hence be simply because of our, our concerns over uh, this, the current situation. But I'd like, if, I'd like to thank you for your time and your efforts and obviously your, uh, engo your ongoing uh, activities to, uh, to the betterment of our uh, residents. So I'd like to thank you for your time today. Uh, if everybody else could remain here, we'll just go through the uh, forward planning and the work programme, please. But thank you indeed for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Councillor Bowman. Goodbye. Thank you, Chair. So just uh, just the just the two last things. Um, it's as always your your work program. Um, so just just to receive that, really, there's nothing nothing to update uh, on that one, and uh, nothing on the board plan of key decisions that uh, fits the subcommittee's terms of reference. So the next meeting is the Tuesday, the fifth of October. Treatment backlog and waiting list. That's quite. Uh, uh, opportune. Uh, we're going to have Huff, NLAG and York FT hopefully and uh, we'll also have a, a COVID recovery plan that will probably be delivered by um, uh, probably Yvonne um, and I would suggest uh, Andy Kingdom as well. But if there's nothing else I'd like to thank you all for your 
uh, time today. Uh, it's certainly a good input from councillors Padden and, uh, and councillor Holmes as uh, additional uh, or replacement councillors. So thank you very much for your time today. And uh, thanks, thanks.